steam to condenser. Wow, that thing is enormous. Each main condenser was connected to its own main engine eduction, eduction? manifold which was bolted to the top of the low pressure turbine's exhaust casing. Each was designed to condense all the steam produced by one main engine. The arrangement and spacing of the tubes inside gave a constant steam speed through the condenser. A wide central lane was provided through the middle of the tube nest for the passage of steam to the bottom of the condenser. This passage allowed for the mixing and reheating of the condensate as it fell from the tube and con collected in a storage well at the bottom. An automatic float operator operated closed feed controller was fitted to allow additional feed water to be withdrawn from one of the main feed tanks. Should the level of feed water drop owing to a sudden demand by the feed pumps, a proportion of the tubes on each side of the condenser was isolated behind a baffle for cooling the air, which was extracted near the top of the baffle by air ejectors. Large cast iron water boxes were fitted at each end of each main condenser. Each water box was designed to give a uniform flow of cooling water free from eddies at the entrance to all tubes on each side of the condenser. Each was fitted with large main doors that contained a number of smaller inspection hatches strongly ribbed to resist pressure and pulsation. These hatches were used to provide access for survey and overhaul. It's the engine room and it's a giant steam engine. <laughs> so crazy. Wow, look at this thing. Boggles the mind. high pressure ahead turbines. Design and blading supplies by the Parsons Marine Steam Turbine Company Limited. Single flow impulse reaction type. Earth Brown, Sheffield. Harland and Wolf Limited, Grove and Glasgow. Each of the four main engines is fitted with one high pressure head turbine of the sim single flow impulse reaction type. Steam was supplied to each turbine from a one foot four inch diameter ahead steam main. Connected to its own ahead maneuvering valve, controlled by a large hand wheel located on the starting platform. Steam was passed through a strainer before entering the inlet of the turbine's nozzle chest, located at the top end of the casing. Valves were fitted in each chest to control nozzles which were designed to increase the velocity and direct the steam through the impulse blading. Each nozzle chest contained 35 nozzles of which 17 were open to the steam supplied from the maneuvering valves. In addition to these open nozzles, each chest was provided with two 6-inch valves controlling eight nozzles and two 6 and 3 quarter inch valves controlling 
10 nozzles. This allowed 17, 21, 22, 25, 26, 27, 30, or 35 nozzles to be used according to the horsepower desired. OMG, two six and three quarter inch bypass valves were also provided for obtaining overload power when required. As the steam left the nozzles, it traveled in a single flow, passing through first two rotor rows and one casing row of impulse blading. After leaving the impulse stage, the steam then passed through two expansions in the reaction portion of the turbine. Each expansion had seven rotor rows and seven casing rows of reaction blading. The steam was discharged through the exhaust casting at the opposite end of the turbine and was led through receiver pipe connected to the first intermediate pressure ahead turbine's inlet casing. Each turbine was fitted with a dummy piston and cylinder at the steam inlet end in order to reduce unbalanced steam thrust on the turbine rotor. Each dummy was of the Mitchell sphere, was of the axial contact type, fitted with 30 contact strips on a cylinder with dummy strips being made solid with the piston. Any unbalanced steam thrust that was produced was taken up by Mitchell spherical, spherical seated thrust bearings fitted to the rotor spindle. Each turbine rotor body was forged in one solid piece having three, the three inch hole machine bored through its entire length. Each impulse, ba impulse belayed wheel and dummy cylinder was forged integral with the rotor body. The reaction blading portion was of the end tightened type, built up in segments varying in length from three to three and a half inches. Each blade was held in position by root wire, hmm. with separate packing pieces fitted together with binding wire passing through each blade. Monel metal, shroud, metal shrouding was fitted on the first and second reaction expansions. Packing pieces and root wires were braced solid with special junction stiffening wires fitted between gaps in between of the segments. The first row of <laughs> impulse blades were of a special design in which the blade root and tip were machined from one solid bar of stainless iron. The blades were welded in groups of four at their tips and braced at their roots to form one segment, tied together by a center binding wire. The second row of impulse blades were machined with integral roots from solid bars of stainless steel and fitted individually with the blade tips tied together by stainless iron shrouding. Around the circumference, each row of impulse blading was fitted into grooves machined into the impulse blade wheel. The reaction blading was fitted into grooves machined into the rotor body and secured in place by serrated side locking strips. Access hatches were provided on the bottom of the reaction steam belt with two additional hatches located at the top of the exhaust steam belt for inspecting the impulse and reaction blading. <laughs>